Professor uh, Everett, I would really right. like to um, get a little bit, <clears throat> pardon me, a little bit about your personal story. And now I have been on your website and I have looked at it profusely here. Okay. And uh, it's pretty amazing what you're doing. Oh, thanks. How you're doing it. Mm -hmm. And to be honest with you, I never heard of this artist residency program that you have yeah. until Tammy told me about it. Well, I think it's because what we're learning, um, honestly, is that we're one of the few in the world, if not the only one, that is combining those who serve with art in a residency. Now, obviously, you've heard of artist residencies, but ones that are, but one that is specifically geared toward people who serve is, is kind of just us. And we're excited about that. Well, you're excited about it because, especially now that we're living in the world that we're living in, mm -hmm. pandemic times, um, how do you find a way to create? And how do you encourage people like military veterans and first responders? And I know you also do journalists and especially uh, journalists that served in sure. global I'm conflicts. Sure. So how do you provide them a safe space to create well, and the, and why did you do this? Well, it's a it's a great question, and it really f came out of my own personal experience. As you probably noted, my my dad was a veteran of World War II, and um, I myself served in the reserves. And and uh, the way I got into the reserves was kind of funny. I was actually writing a screenplay for Steven Spielberg's company about an aircraft carrier. And part of that research was to go down to San Diego and be given a tour. I think it was of the USS George Washington at that time, but to be given a tour of the aircraft carrier. And so we went down, I went down with my producers in this fancy car, embarrassingly enough, from Hollywood. I was 34 years old and I was working as a screenwriter at a pretty high level in Hollywood. And the person who was assigned to give me the tour was a guy named Steve Fish. And he was then a captain, do you know, Steve? I do actually, I spoke to him yesterday and he, he told me to tell you to say hi. So <laughs> please so funny. I thought it was amazing when I spoke to him yesterday and the first thing we, he mentioned was, do you know about- Oh Ever yeah, he's, great. he's, a great said, advocate. he's a great. So it was Steve that was giving me that tour on the aircraft carrier. And I was of course thinking, oh, I'm a hotshot writer. You know, I don't need to, you know, join the reserves or anything, but it was him that brought up the idea of the direct commission program so that I'd already had a master's and stuff. And they said, well, if you apply to this program, it's kind of hard to get in, but if you get in, you kind of go right to an officer billet. Well, that was, you know, sort of true, you know, but it takes, as you know, sometimes a long time to find that billet and time to find that job. So I, I went and I joined the Navy and I started as an E probably two or something. I put on my cap and I put on those, those flare trousers and I waited for a year to get an officer situation. But before that, I was going up to Point Magoo and Point Wanimi and I was picking up cigarette butts on the weekends and doing all these kinds of jobs. And I had this kind of dual life between being this Hollywood writer and being this guy who was picking up cigarette butts. And it was the best thing that ever happened to me. It was the best thing because it humbled me and it made me really understand what service was. Um, I met, um, Cheryl, I met people that I never would have met before, rich people, poor people, green people, black people, brown people. There was real diversity there, meaning, you know, as you know, you were forced to live together. So, the, you know, everybody thought as one. All you saw was a fellow shipmate. You didn't see anything else. And so that really changed my view, you know, and, and really, and more importantly, it got me out of that kind of LA grind of writing these scripts and complaining about your agent and all that sort of narcissistic stuff that happens in, in LA. And so that was my journey. And then I was assigned when I did become an officer to Navinfo East. I was a PAO, a public affairs officer. Um, it so happens around 2001, I was assigned to our office in New York City, at the time I was a visiting professor at Whitman College in Walla Walla. And one of the reasons I joined the Navy, what, uh, and I had the support of my wife at the time, and, she's, and I said, well, look, what's gonna happen in New York? Nothing will happen in New York, don't worry about me. 
And so 2001 and the attacks happen. And then I find a way to get to, you know, to um, ground zero a few days. As you know, there were almost no planes. So I found a way to get there and then witness that first thing, wrote about it as a journalist. You know, I would have liked to have helped save people, but there was nobody to save. And um, so I, I stayed around as a journalist and I just started taking notes and writing. Well, that combination, Cheryl, of, of my creative life and real life horror um, inspired me to write a story called Adopt a Sailor. That was a short play that became a movie that I directed uh, my first time directing. So all those things are happenstance. All those things were that I wasn't planning at all to be a film director. I liked writing. Um, you know, my time in the Navy was a great gift, I thought. And so cut to 20 years or what, 15 years later, when I have this idea, how can I somehow be a conduit between those who serve and those who create? And, and also, why is there such a huge chasm between our everyday culture and the military? Why is it that only 1% maybe um, of our population serve? And why don't we know each other? Why, why are you know, you know, from the Vietnam era, there was almost no bigger chasm than then in 1968. You know what it was like between those people coming home and those people at home. They were vilified. They weren't welcomed. You know, their, their service wasn't appreciated. It doesn't matter about policy. You don't have to agree with, you know, why we were there or what our, our goals were. But I always felt you had to honor the warrior, you know, that's and, exactly um, right. And so I thought, so, so I thought, okay, I want to build a place where I help people tell stories of their times, stories that are important, that people that go through real problems and real experiences. And so that is how basically it was born. And for almost five years, we've had this, this house out in the high desert of California, and we've done everything we could to get people there. We've had amazing residents. Even over the last year, we've been able to get a couple people in there because they're alone, basically. They don't, you know, they don't live with anybody. They're out in the high desert. You know, it's pretty safe out there, COVID-wise. So, so that's the basic journey. So, you know, since you, you've had a professional Hollywood career, I'm assuming part of the reason that you have this residency program is to help veterans and first responders really just to kind of get away from it all and yeah. just create Absolutely. in whatever medium they want Absolutely. to do that. I've yeah, noticed I mean, that some, some of the artists you've had, like uh, I, I saw on your website, you had this, and I think she was a Navy veteran, mm -hmm. uh, this woman who uh, makes ceramics. A school, yeah, a ceramist, yeah. Um, Editor. Yes. She's terrific. Writers. Yeah. Right. Exactly. And, and the whole point is exactly as you said, when I was a graduate student going through grad school, I was broke and I got loans through, you know, the roof and I didn't have time to write, you know, I was worried about paying the bills or I, my parents were not alive at, at the time and, and I had to, you know, find a way to survive as all artists do starting out, especially. And so I was lucky enough to get a couple artist residencies from pretty famous places. Edward Albee, um, the famous playwright, had a place yes. out in Montauk and he invited me to go up there and write for a month. He paid for my food. He paid for everybody who was there, painters, artists, writers. Um, There's another place, um, you know, that um, the Malay colony out in the Berkshires that invited me to be there for a month. So, so there I had an experience where I could live for a month, Cheryl, not worry about rent, not worry about food, not worry about you know, everyday things. And I actually got in a, in, in a position where I could concentrate on my work. And it, it, that's the whole point of the Everett House is to basically um, greet them there and say, you know what, this is your place. We give you a little money for food. We give, give you a little money for getting here. Now just go do your thing. We don't monitor them. We don't require that they hand stuff in. You know, we, we just look over who wants to go there, make sure they're a credible artist, that they've really been practicing their craft. And then we give them the house. And then sometimes it'll be a few days, sometimes it'll be 10 days, sometimes it'll be a month, but they do their thing and then they leave and, and that's it, you know? And it's been incredibly, incredibly satisfying. Like you talked about earlier, you really don't appreciate veterans 
or really understand their sacrifice mm -hmm. until you yourself are in the military and you okay. have to go through, mm -hmm. they have to tear you down yeah. and build you back up. So mm -hmm. you learn to become a team player and think mm -hmm. of your teammates first right. before you think of yourself. That's the whole yeah. point of the military. Yes, it's a big deal. It's a big deal. Mm -hmm. And so when a lot of these veterans get out of the military especially now that it's mm -hmm. the 20-year war is winding down in the yeah. afghanistan right troops, they're coming back right. from there um there's going to be a lot of issues absolutely and learning to take that mm -hmm. ptsd mm -hmm. and dealing with it in a creative way not only helps mm -hmm. others but the author itself and i would really yeah. love for you to speak to that as a creative? Sure. Uh, I'll tell you what my experience has been. We met a guy out in the high desert. This gives you an experience. He wasn't an official resident at all of the Everett House, but he was a guy named Mike who was a veteran from Vietnam, um, probably then in 65, 70. Um, and, he, and, and we needed somebody to help put our flag up the pole, literally, because it was such an old apparatus. We needed a handyman to come and, and help us do that. And also, to reach it because there was no, it wasn't one of those newfangled ones that you could kind of bring down, you know? And so we reached out to Craigslist or something and said, help wanted, blah, blah, blah. This guy shows up, Mike, quiet as heck, you know, a bit grizzled, you know, obviously life had been a little bit challenging at times. And um, he, he came and he said, I think I could do that. I could do that. I said, well, how are you going to, you know, get the actual line up? because it's not the flag that's our problem, it's getting the line through that you know, tool up there that'll let the flag go up. He said, well, I'll think of something, I'll come by tomorrow. And I said, okay, take care, I'll see you, Mike. And he comes back the next day and he has a, a fishing line, he has a, a fishing pole, a big old fishing pole, and he has fishing wire and he loops it in and he ties it to the, to the rope and he, he throws it up there, you know, and it goes <laughs> right around the thing goes around twice and it comes down and he did it in like 30 seconds, right? And so we're able to do that. We're like, Mike, thanks so much and blah, blah, blah. And um, a friend of mine knew Mike for locally. So I, I noticed that Mike was kind of taciturn, kind of quiet. And I, so I, I naturally start asking questions. It's kind of the writer in me, you know? Mike, have you been around here a while? He's very shut down, very quiet, very quiet. And I know when to stand back, you know this, right? You know when to just give space and stand back. And I said, well, Mike, thank you so much. Please let us give you something for sandwich money or gas money or something. No, no, no. I said, no, I, Mike, I insist. He goes, no, it's no problem. Uh, it's okay. And uh, he said, nice place here. Nice place. I said, thanks, man. And what's it about? And I told them to get veterans to come here and write. You know, we're not a health uh, organization. We're not qualified. We, we, we just provide the house. You know, we're not asking people questions. We're not doing surveys. So he said, oh, so they just come here and do stuff and write? I said, yeah. And I said something like, um, did, you, um, did you serve, Mike? He said, yeah, I was in Vietnam. And, and he's just quiet. And I just let him sit there. And he starts going into a story about some of his service that was harrowing. And I didn't say a word. And I just listened to him. And I made eye contact. And he talked for about 25 minutes. And I said, well, Mike, thanks. Thanks for just for talking to me. I appreciate it. I was OK. And, you know, we give him sandwich money. We, we had to stuff it in his pocket. You know, he wouldn't take it. And off he went. Never saw him again. But what a connection, right? There, there's a guy that I'm sure doesn't want to talk about anything. I didn't pull it out of him. But it was the space, Cheryl, and it was the intention of our place that made him feel safe to just talk about stuff. And that is how we get paid. That's what we do it for. How do you make a difference in somebody's life? And yeah. sometimes just one little nugget or one little conversation, like Absolutely. you had that conversation with that Vietnam mm -hmm. veteran that may have affected him in such a positive way mm -hmm. that unfortunately you haven't seen him again, but mm -hmm. it probably caused him to do a lot of internal. Yeah, uh, it could be. And also that's okay. I mean, I don't require, you know, it's like, so sometimes, you know, we're ships that pass in the night, right? I mean, sometimes we're meant to see each other just then and that's okay, you know? 
And, um, but I look at just the experience and, and you know, coming from a family of World War II people, like my dad just didn't talk about it. You know, he just wasn't, I, I wasn't young, I wasn't old enough when he passed away to really delve into it. But I know he was in Europe. I know he served there. I know he was in pretty hot places. And I just never got a chance. But when I asked people about him after he had died years, years later, you know, the place is named for him. It's dedicated to him, our residency. Yes. Um, everybody said the same thing. The funniest, nicest, sweetest guy. Hey, did he ever talk about his service? Not a word. But did you know that, that you know? generation never did. Yeah. That was There's part of the problem. Refreshing about it and sad about it. Yeah, you know? because in my own family, I um, oh my God, if I knew then what I know now, right, you, right. you know, I could have really done an oral history with my parents, all three mm -hmm. of them, because sure. of their unique experiences sure. serving during that time. So mm -hmm. those stories are lost. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, but I, I'm very impressed with the fact that you did name it after your father. Sure. And because yeah, that in itself. Well, it was my way, you know, I mean, I, I guess I haven't seen him for 40 some years now. So it was my way of keeping him in my life and hopefully in my kids' lives. My kids volunteer there. And um, my son, John, was in the USC cadets for a couple of years and did great job there. And, and, and so it, it's just my way of, of keeping him present, you know, and, and, you know, because it's a father that I never had to have that talk with. You know, and, and even my joining, you know, the reserves, even though my service was negligible compared to his, just being, like you said, part of the culture really helped me understand, you know, and really got me out of, you know, what is what could be a pretty selfish, self-involved culture, especially in Hollywood or emanating from Hollywood, you know, um, you know, it's an interesting relationship. I know Steve Fish can talk to you about this because he used to work on uh, nav info west there and would would do all these liaisons with studios and stuff like that when when, when i directed adopt a sailor um as a film our our first scene was in a big ship you know and we couldn't afford to get it and it was my connections in the navy that that enabled uh, us getting to a place where the navy gave us this is true <laughs> ships to use to shoot on as they were coming into fleet week in new york city and they, they flew us from the, the wharf there out to, you know, the Atlantic Ocean. We landed on a Navy helicopter. We were able to shoot young Ethan Peck, who was the star actor, shoot him as he's coming into New York. Well, our movie had a budget of about $200,000, which you know is like cigar money for Arnold Schwarzenegger. That's not, that's not like a real movie budget. Right. But the Navy, the Navy saved us millions of dollars. You know, so... So my service, you know, was small compared to the, the way I was able to benefit from those connections and make a million friends. And, but also, like you said, you know, be able to talk with Mike when he came out to fix the flag in a way that at least he understood, even though my service didn't touch his, but at least he understood I was in at one time. Right, because I think, it's, I don't think you have to be a combat veteran right. You relate to another combat veteran Absolutely. but if you're a veteran and you've served that's right. the commonality because that's what you know that's that's the um people really don't get it unless they come from a military family or they themselves have served they really don't understand the sacrifice of people that choose yep. not that are forced to that's serve right. That's right. but that volunteer to go into the military yes but in and my day in, in during vietnam there was no choice for the men. That's right. That's if you right. were drafted, you had to go. Yeah, no, there, that was the way it went. And, um, and, you know, that's part of what we, why we started this program as well, is because bridge that, why is there such a gap between those who serve and the rest of society? There doesn't have to be, you know? Um, they, they sort of, you know, a lot of people in the area of um, where the, the house is, when they found out what we did, their first assumption, of course, was, oh, it's a halfway house or they're a bunch of messed up veterans. You know, their first assumption is, oh, they're messed up. So you have a house for them and they do meetings and they're drinking. And I said, no, actually, no. The, the people that come here, like all of us, they might have issues, but they're accomplished artists. They have lives, they have jobs, they go forward. 
you know, that, but that Hollywood image of every veteran is a, is a gun happy, trigger happy, about to go off on a shooting rampage, that really bothers me. Well, and as it should be, but that's also part of what Hollywood does is to create these stereotypes. Right. And in actuality, few, few veterans right. really, okay. really are that stereotype. Right. Exactly. And, and when you have PTSD and you have traumatic brain injury, mm -hmm. TBI, it's learning how to cope and work within those disabilities. And mm -hmm. how do you do that? And that's part of what you do through your residency mm -hmm. program mm -hmm. is you, like you said earlier, you offer them a safe space. That's so it. now I'd like to talk a little bit about how COVID impacted your organization sure. and how you are um, opening up now and what if, if someone is interested in applying a veteran or a first responder, how they would go about that process. Absolutely. So, so COVID stopped us like it did everybody else for a while. It was, as you know, everything was shut down in California. Um, I was back East actually with my kids. We were hunkered down about seven miles from New York City. It was pretty scary. Um, as we got through that initial year, like all of us, I was able to get back West and we did some work on the grounds. And then we said, let's see if we can get some some you know, short time residents here. We don't have to be with them physically if they feel comfortable coming. And we had a couple of residents since then that did terrific work, a couple of Vietnam vets, as I recall. And, um, and then we were basically worked on the grounds, you know, and we were able to, okay, let's try to develop these grounds. Let's try to make it uh, a better house. Let's do all that kind of thing. As far as outreach, how we get people, it's really word of mouth, like you heard with Steve. We have a pretty cool website that people could go to. Um, I have interns that are going to get the word out and continue to get the word out that we exist. But we're pretty much a mom and pop shop. You know, we're not a we're not a giant you know charity. We're not we don't operate that way. You know, it's it's not for profit. We take that literally. It's definitely not for profit, and we you know. I'm sure I lose money on it, but I don't care, you know, and um, for, for me, it's, it's about connecting with that population and about finding a way to do that. But, but basically, we, we also like to see ourselves as more than just the house, um, Cheryl, it's the program, meaning let's connect um, veterans with a place to create. So I'm assuming your sense of purpose is helping yeah. the veterans or yeah. the first responders or the combat journalists yeah. to unlock that yes. and free their mind to where they can just let the creativity flow. Yes, absolutely. That's exactly what I get out of it. It's that facilitation. You know, you, you realize you're really a facilitator. You know, I'm not a doctor. I'm not, even though I'm a professor in real life and I'm a writer director in real life, it's not what I am there. I mean, but I, I clean the toilets. I, I do the yard. My son came and helped dig out a driveway. My daughter came and helped clean up the place. You know, my wife has been incredibly supportive. I mean, you know, there's no reason to do this, you know, other than that, that service gives you something. That service is the reason to do it, you know, and, and, and also we live in a time where I think you can agree that service is challenged now. I mean, the idea of give, of, of doing something for some reason other than your own self-interest, right? In other words, we, we spend our day trying to get ahead. We wanna make a big deal. We wanna write this, direct this. We wanna make a million bucks, whatever, just to stop and say, wait, maybe I could do something that isn't about me, that doesn't benefit me. And then you realize when you're benefiting other people, what great benefit that is to you. My dad, who, you know, who obviously I revere, um, used to do something with us back in Thanksgiving. I remember this. We lived in Rutherford, New Jersey, which is about seven miles from New York. It's about 10 miles from Newark, New Jersey. And in the late 60s, early 70s, it was a real challenged place, you know, the riots and stuff like that. Well, on Thanksgiving, he used to take us kids and drive through Newark. And it wasn't to be a tourist. It was because he wanted us to see how bloody lucky we were that we had a family and that we had a big turkey later that day and that we had all these things. And he just told us, remember how fortunate you are, you know, never get too big headed, never, you know, always be modest. And, and I really remember those lessons of his, you know. How many um, 
veterans are you accepting this year? Oh, well, let's see. For, for this year, because of where we are geographically, as you know, it gets real hot up in the high desert. So what we do is we really have October, January, and March as our open months because those are beautiful times to be up there. And, you know, if we did summer months, we'd have to pay like $1,000 a month just in air conditioning. It wouldn't be worth it. We, we don't do usually November, December because people have holidays and families and we don't want to do that. So we do kind of limit it to those few months. Um, you know, we'll put feelers out, you know, we'll just go forward and we've already gotten obviously some inquiries uh, to look over. So we'll decide the next couple months what to do, but it is nice. We appreciate in the summer, we're able to take a bit of a break, reassess the program and see what we want to do next. But our idea is to always find a way to give somebody some place to stay. And so what's the capacity? Two, two, for two to four oh, veterans? Oh, that's the thing. No, it's it's one at a time. I mean, they have the whole house to themselves. Oh, uh, Which okay. is really neat. And that that was one of the reasons we could do it soon after COVID because it wasn't a matter of that. They're, they're really, they're already quarantined up there. You know, now we have a situation where, where um, we we are absolutely, if, if there's a spousal situation where it would make a difference and we'd love to invite spouses, if, if kids are of age, a little bit older, maybe 12, 14, well, we'd be willing to accept that. We accept dogs, you know, so we understand people have lives and they can't just unplug suddenly. So we try to facilitate that as much as possible. And also I'm just a big dog lover. So I understand that. Oh, do you um, have dogs there? Um, yeah, well, here where I'm, I'm right here in Palm Desert. I have my one dog here right now, but, um, but there's no dogs that live up there. But if somebody has a dog, we're not gonna say no, as long as they know they can't go running out into the desert, because as you know, it could be very unsafe for dogs out there. So they have to contain them. So um, so how big is your house? Is it two bedrooms, three oh, bedrooms, it's a, the, the house, it's a It's a ranch, it's a one level ranch, three bedrooms, but one room is, what we call a studio where they could compose or write. The other, the other is an office, and then there's one big bedroom. So they they have the whole run of the ranch house. It's not a big house; it's only about a thousand square feet. But there's two acres fence, you know. So there's lots of places to hike and walk and get out. Um, so and, and it has terrific views, and um, so it's really a blessing. It really is a great a great property. It just needed a lot of work, and there was a lot of work to do on it, but you know, we feel like that's mostly done. I don't know where this is going to lead, but I do know that unlocking creativity in the veteran community is a key for a successful, happy life for many veterans that they don't know that they are artists yet. Yes, that's right. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. So on that note, I think, um, right, sir, we're nice done. And you. thank you so yeah. much. And I really appreciate you taking the time. My pleasure. Have a great day. Okay. You too. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.